The final season is the affair at its best. This season, Noah is no closer to any reconciliation with his ex-wife. All I want is to maintain a co-parenting relationship for the sake of the kids. There is radical forgiveness on Helen's part, but of course, tragedy strikes. I would do anything to undo what happened. It's been six years. I think I'm gonna miss all of it. It's gonna be a rather sad farewell. Uh, you're not joining the meeting, are you? Um, what's I came here for? <laughs> Door is locked at a certain time, and, and uh, you know, no one comes in. I didn't know that. I heard a rumor about something about locking people out, but I never. <laughs> <you're not officially. laughs> yeah, well, um, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry I'm sorry, I'm late. No, but so am I, but you're gonna be able to stay. I would just like to urge you that th this is serious business because from these meetings come the records that Motown releases to the street. We've got to maintain our high standards because if the records are not created properly, then uh, we have a bad image out there. Luckily for us, we have one record in the top 10 this week, which is always good with the Marvin Tammy record. The artists that are wide open for releases are Diana Ross and Supremes, which we're working on heavily. We have what I consider a smash on the four tops. Stevie Wonder has a couple of things, but he is still open. Temptations are still open. They have a few things that I've heard that were cut that I think will be extremely good. Um, Smokey Robinson and the Miracles, Gladys Knight and the Pips, Edwin Starr, we're gonna release this thing. Martha was just sort of cleared up here. We're gonna release her thing. Junior Walker has a couple of things. And then we have this thing on the Ashley Brothers, right? We will not compromise with quality. I hear many producers talking about, you know, well, they don't get releases and this and that. First one stay here 10 years, and if they don't have the proper quality on a major artist, they will never get a release on a major artist. But the opportunity, as I said before, is here. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, if there are no further comments, then the meeting is adjourned till next week. mind the Motown story begins long before we thought it began. I never met a girl who makes me feel the way that you do. You're all right. I never asked who makes love me feel I said you do. You're outside. So be fine. Oh, oh. Look out, baby, because here I come. I was always a hustler trying to make money, trying to better myself. Somehow I was fascinated by everybody being the same, you know, white and black. They stub their toe, they hurt, there's something funny, they laugh. I mean, it was like, to me, just almost a no-brainer. As a kid, I would sell uh, Michigan Chronicle, which was a black newspaper. I said I could make a lot more money if I sell it to white people too. One day I decided to go downtown, take my little black papers in the white neighborhood, and I sold more papers than I'd ever sold before. And I took my brother down next week, I said, we're gonna get rich, baby. We went down to the white neighborhood and we sold nothing. You know, it was my first lesson. The one black kid was cute, two were a threat to the neighborhood. <laughs> you are about to witness the very exciting story of a city and its people. Detroit, today, stands at the threshold of a bright new future, one rich with the promise of fulfillment. In this bustling city on the Straits, there is a resurgence of civic pride and unfettered imagination. The city on the Straits welcomes you to share that vision as it continues to plan, to build, and yes, to dream. My starting in music business was an evolution. Of course, this was over a period of years. I was a shoeshine boy, a boxer. I was writing songs. But if I had just right away made money, I don't know what 
might have happened to me, but I kept getting knocked down. I knew I wanted to be in music, so I had this record store. I didn't realize the customer was always right. They come in and they say, you got something by Muddy Waters or B.B. King, and I was trying to sell them jazz. I would say, look, if you want Muddy Waters, go down to Hay Street, they sell Muddy Waters. I ain't got it, and it ain't gonna happen. From Detroit to the river. It's only 12 bars, 12 bar blues. They all say the same thing. I love my baby, but my baby don't love me. I mean, how many times can you say that in how many different ways? But the people in Detroit that worked at the factories, they wanted the blues. And so I realized it was that simplicity in the music that people understood and people felt good about. I did get the blues, but it was too late for it to change my business because I was bankrupt. So I had to get a real job. And that's why I went to the Ford Motor Company, Lincoln Mercury plant. And when I was on the assembly line, I started perfecting my skills of writing songs. The factory had this assembly line. And I would see the cars start out the bare metal frame and go around the circle and different stations would put things on there and they would go out another door a brand new car i said my goodness i can do this for people of course everybody laughed at me and said no that's ridiculous you can't take human beings and treat them like cars i said no i'm not gonna do that everybody's gonna have their own personality but i got this idea one station here producers over here arrangers over here Dance instructors over here, they go from room to room and, and come off a brand new star. And eventually when I felt that it was right, and my sisters promised me they could get my songs to Jackie Wilson, I quit my job and I was ready. The factory played such an important part because I saw the machine and how it could work with the assembly line process that I based my company on. unsung heroes and and people that were just part of the team part of the effort but there was no bond greater than Smokey who is still my best friend today if I were doing this I'd call this just forget everything else and say bury and smoke <laughs> you know just bury and smoke I always loved singing and singing seemed like my impossible dream because of where I was growing up I didn't think that would be available to me. Coming back to Detroit, you know, getting these thoughts and memories and reflections is just incredible, you know. Yeah. And, and you know something else I think about, man? I used to be riding with you when they first got the record players in the car. Yeah. And yeah. you'd be driving, and you'd be ducking your head on, where's the new Supremes record, man? <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. I will find the record, man. You just try <laughs> Smokey Robinson was a member of a group that was auditioning for Jackie Wilson's manager. So we sang for them, and they uh, they rejected us. And I walked out in the hallway with them, and I said, oh, you guys were really good. I said, oh, thank you very much, man. You know, he said, yeah, he said, uh, I'm Barry Gordy. What? The Barry Gordy who wrote Reed Petit? Yeah, only one I know, you know. And then he made a mistake because he said, uh, you got any more songs, man? <laughs> and I had a loose leaf notebook with about 100 songs in it. And he said, a song has got to be like a short story where the beginning and the middle and the ending tie in together. He said, you, you, you rhyme stuff really well. He said, but your songs are just rambling, you know, which they were. And so he started to mentor me. Walked all day till my feet were tired. Yeah. 
the first record that we ever recorded uh, was a song called Got a Job. And Barry would produce records on us and put them with other record companies because Barry hadn't started Motown yet. Got a Job was in the top five of the R&B chart, so we know that it sold some records. I got a job. When it came time to pay the royalties, this guy sent Barry a check for $3.19. Back in those days, man, they paid you if they wanted to. If they didn't, they didn't pay you, especially if you were black. So Smokey said, if this is the kind of money you're going to get, you might as well be in business for yourself. <laughs> so shortly after that, he started Motown. And um, the rest is history, man. <laughs> family needs a home, and it was my then assistant and future wife, Raynoma, who found the two-story house at 2648 West Grand Boulevard. And the fact that it was in the neighborhood. It was on West Grand Boulevard at 12th Street. You don't get more hood than that. At his feel, everything was in-house. The offices, the studio, the sales department. I even lived upstairs. And it goes back to my great-grandparents, Barry Gordy Sr. and Bertha Ida Gordy. They raised their children in an entrepreneurial environment. Well, the family grocery store was named after Booker T. Washington, who was a big advocate of self-sufficiency. Growing up, I knew that was a very important principle for our family. My grandmother put together this family savings club called the Burberry Co-op. And essentially, it's their own loaning institution within the family. She was tough with money. Yeah. I mean, I begged for $1,000. She only okayed 800 How <laughs> tough is that? <laughs> that was the beginning of what we know as Motown today. That was his first investment. Yeah, this was the magic room. Then we started off with one track. Everything was on one track. Then we got two tracks. We thought we were the most innovative people in the world. We could put our lead singer in there, have them separate. We were always looking for magic, always looking for that magical sound, you know. Or, or, or to be with him doing a mix, you know. He makes he do like 327 mixes on one tune and use number two. <laughs> notorious for that. Well, Barry's gonna mix it. No, no, please, please, don't let Barry mix the two. What Sometimes you have it perfect and you want to just get it better. You know, you want to get it better. Barry, Barry thinks that if we could get a much clearer sound out of this studio and everything, that the records would be bigger. But I disagree with this. There must be something in the sound that we're putting on the street because this is what everybody's trying to come. I don't understand. Now, if you had a clearer sound on my guy, it would have went more pop, it would have stayed on top longer, and that would have been it. The sound could use improvement, man, but there must be something to the sound, and that's the they, what they want to produce. They want you. I mean, they want your sound. That's right. They don't want, that's right. They've never said that. They've never said, well, we want your sound. They said, we want the Motown sound. No one could duplicate our sound because even though I didn't think it was that good, yeah, you know, he, and I used he to thought the it was great. Arguments about that man. The man, are you kidding? New York is trying to get our sound. They're sending people here to record in Detroit, thinking they're going to get our sound, but you they know, couldn't get our sound because yeah. our echo chamber was the bathroom upstairs. <laughs> exactly. People would come off the road and come to the studio because. Something was always going on, you know, 24 hours a day. Somebody would be in that studio recording, <sighs> doing something. <laughs> this is it. <laughs> I remember Chop Around, which was the first million seller for Motown, took 20 minutes to write. Just flowed out. So I ran to Barry's office. I said, I got it, Barry. He said, let me hear it, man. So we go down to the piano room. Just because you become a young man now. That's how it was, you know. We put the record out. The record's been out for about two and a half weeks. It's doing fair. It's doing okay. It's doing pretty good, you know. Three o'clock in the morning, one morning, my phone rings. <phone rings> Hello? Smoke? I said, yeah. He says, me, Barry, man. I said, no, man, I recognize your voice. He said, what's happening? I said, what do you think is happening, man? I said, I'm asleep. What's happening with you? Shop around won't let me sleep, man. 
He said, well, I just didn't feel right about the record, man. I didn't, we didn't have the magic. He said, well, I'm gonna change everything about it. I'm gonna change the beat, I'm gonna change the sound, I'm gonna change the feeling, I'm changing everything. And I said, okay, man, that's cool. But he said, I said, I'll see you tomorrow. He said, no, 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 I mean right now. <laughs> <laughs> Three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> so we came over here and everybody showed up, like I told you, except for the piano player. So he played the piano himself on the record. And the shop around them went to number one. The first million seller was, the, was his redo of it after the record had been out. Now I want you to get ready. I just because you become a young man. It's just a thing that you don't understand. Before you had some girl. But that's how we did stuff. We didn't care. He didn't care because it had been out for two weeks. So what? It's not too late. No, the masses of people haven't heard it because it's not really a hit right now. <laughs> you know what I mean? Before you take a girl and say I do now, I make sure she's in love with you now. My mama told me. Come on. was able to accomplish everything that they accomplished because they were self-sufficient. When you can just do what you want without somebody breathing over your neck telling you what you should or shouldn't do, that's when the real magic starts to happen. To be successful in the music business, you gotta have hit records. I'm a producer, I'm a writer, I'm a this, I'm a that, but really, I feel myself as a teacher, and so I had to find songwriters to teach. Smokey was my first project. Before that, I was on the top of the totem pole. I was like the man because I wrote the songs, I produced them. But then Smokey, one day he came into my office and uh, he wanted me to hear a new song. I thought it was just one of the greatest new clever songs I'd ever known. And this was the day I knew that he, I had a little genius on my hands, you know. I will build you a castle with the tower so high. It reaches the moon. I've got a melody, some birdies that fly. And compose you a tune. Give your loving, warm as mama's oven. And if that don't do, I'll try something new. And I was just blown away. Then I'll try something new. I had this wonderful feeling, but also this scary feeling that I was my throne. Is, here's a guy that's writing a song that I could not ever think of. And I was a songwriter, I was a teacher. And from that day forward, I started slipping from my post because he started coming up with major hits. And every day we can play on the Milky Way. And if that don't do, then I'll try something. I always thought maybe I could one day in my life compete with him with girls, you know. Oh, oh, but that was out of the question. You're hearing this story from Casanova no, himself. No, no, no. You're hearing this story from Casanova <laughs> himself, exactly. you know. I mean, exactly. <laughs> you know, Bob Dylan's called him America's greatest poet, and he really did write poetry. He was so honest. So straightforward. I mean, the lyrics don't take a lot to decipher, but then you realize it took a lot of genius to write them. At the time, Smokey was doing his thing, singing to the women. He created so many babies with his romance and his feeling of that. And a but lot he, of them were his. But... <laughs> My key writing team was Smokey Robinson and Holland Dozier Holland. We were not trained musicians. You know, Brian would skip school to come there to learn to write songs. I had no idea about writing. I knew that Smokey, in my opinion, was the greatest writer ever, mm -hmm. okay? And I still do. So I took two songs of Smokey's, and I wrote all the lyrics down, and I studied them. And he had this idea, he said, look, man, you and Brian can do the tracks and melodies and come up with the, the ideas, and I'll be sitting there waiting, and y'all shoot them to me, and I'll jump on the lyrics. And that became in Holland, or just Holland, you know, and it became a factory within a factory. It was somebody in every corner writing a song, and they were young. 
And these guys were coming up 17, 18, 19. They were young, so Barry was like a coach, you know, with a, with a great, young, talented team, and everybody was trying to play their best game. Barry was very patient with me. Uh, at the time, I think I was a secretary, and that was in order to justify the $30 a week I was getting. <laughs> Norman hung around here for years before he even got a chance to get in the studio to do any records. Playing tambourine, that's how he started, from the bottom. Mm -hmm. And then finally, he, he, he was doing that good, and he got his confidence. And when he started producing, man, he was incredible, awesome. He had electricity, magic. And then we brought in Nick and Val. They were writer and producer team out of New York. When we landed, we were like so excited. Motown, we've arrived as songwriters. This is a, a dream come true. And we got in a taxi. We said, well, take us to Motown. And we got down to the two little buildings on West Grand Boulevard. I said, hey, look, we want to go to the main office. Yeah. Said, well, this is the only Motown I know. <laughs> that little Hitsville, oh. USA. But the hits were coming out of that little building. Norman Whitfield, Holland Dozier, and Holland Smokey. Up, they were all they, the greatest. They were coming up with songs that you I did not think of that. Because of that Motown structure and because of the feelings of all the producers and the writers and the freedom that Barry Gordy gave all of us, it made that company extremely prolific. Being a teacher also means finding ways to unlock people's true potential. And at Motown, we took that very seriously. Barry Gordy's great ability was to be able to sense the, the talent that one had. I always felt that Marvin Gaye was so much more talented than even he realized. Marvin wanted to be another Frank Sinatra, but that really wasn't his style. But he is so good looking. <laughs> it's a little difficult trying to sing behind him and look at him at the same time. He wanted to change his career many times, you know. One time he wanted to be a football player, a boxer, you know. He wanted to be an astronaut. You know what I'm saying? Marvin, you know, you're, you're a singer. You know, I started at Motown as a jazz singer. I couldn't uh, sell a bean. I was sitting at the piano all night in a very depressed mood. So anyway, Barry blaséed in. So he stopped me. He said, listen, what are, what are you doing? What are you singing there? So I said, it's a song I'm writing. It was a jazz version. I would say, um, I'm just a stubborn kind of fella. Got my mind made up. Shadu boo wow. You know, very jazzy, you know. He said, yeah, but that's not going to sell any records. I said, oh, well, you know, I... Thought I'd give it the old try. Barry could sense what needed to happen to make it pop. And I'm not saying pop, meaning pop music, but I'm saying to make it have that thing. So anyway, Barry said, listen, why don't you put this chord right here on it? Duh. I said, oh, man, that's You're killing my jazz, song. man. So then he said, yeah, 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 yeah. So I said, oh, well, that would say. He said, now right here, the uh, group can say, do, do, do. <laughs> We finished it up, and I said, listen, it'll never sell a thing. And as it turned out, it was a, a great big smash. I think of no other record company where the head could sit down and write a song as well as he could. Say yeah, yeah, yeah. Say yeah, yeah, yeah. So I came to Barry to be an artist, you know. I was saying to myself, I'm gonna be the next Jackie Wilson. So Barry said, I heard you write songs and everything. Let me hear some of your songs. So I'm singing my songs. And he said, your songs are great, but your voice is for shit. I said, what? Man, I grabbed all my music up off the floor, put it in my briefcase. I'm, I'm walking out of here. I'm done with this. He was so fast talking, slick, you know, from the street. 
And so I said, well, Mickey, what else can you do? Can you do A&R? You know, mm-hmm. artists and repertoire. You handle the artists and the music and all that. And he says, whatever it is, I can do it. If there's anything to do with music, man, I'm all over it, man. I say, I record anybody I want to record, anybody you want to record. I said, can I record myself? <laughs> Barry told Mickey he wanted a house band. What we're missing is a band who can play funky. And he said, I got a session coming up. I said, don't worry about it. I know guys that are so funky, <laughs> they are funk themselves. And the best musicians were the jazz musicians. And the brothers in Detroit, they weren't making any money because they weren't getting the respect for what they were doing, but they were still great. It's hard to define just how important Detroit was to Motown. The whole migration from the South and the automotive industry and the churches and the clubs that sprang up would be a vessel to discover talent. I mean, between the church and the clubs and the corner, there was a lot going on. The groups that we had that we grew up with in Detroit as teenagers, if you could not do harmony Mm -hmm. on key, you were lousy, and they Mm -hmm. would tell you, Mm -hmm. get the hell out of here. And get off the corner. They were so smart. It's something about my mama that was called the dozens. And I said, wait a minute, I, I don't, I don't, I don't want you to tell my mama I don't play that. Oh, you don't play that? Well, then, then pat your foot while I play it. You know, and then <laughs> you would do the ham bone on me. Uh, you don't do the ham bone, man. I don't do the ham bone. I ham bone, I. <laughs> well, that used to be the thing, the ham bone. Yeah, yeah. I and I do that, and then I would, I make up song. Yeah, me and your mama. <laughs> So music existed in the community, but it took a place like Hitsville to sort of give those people a place to come to collaborate. So I would pick them. I finally put together a great unit of guys. And they became the Funk Brothers, and they became our house band. We hired the jazz musicians because they were smarter than normal musicians. They could do all this stuff. But Jameson, who was always doing upbeats and downbeats and jazzy things, he would get off the beat. And I look around, I'd be walking over to him, and he'd be up, and then he'd catch himself, and he'd do a whole arpeggio and stuff. You know, and he was right on the, and I would get him, and I'd get there, and he was sounding so good. I said, that's pretty good. Can you do that riff again? When I think of Benny Benjamin and James Jameson and Robert White and Rob Van Dyke, Thomasina, and on and on and on, You've got to know that I was picking up from all those various musicians trying to figure out how to do it. Paul Reiser, when he came there doing the arrangement, he was only 18 years old. One of the greatest arrangers ever. Just out of high school. Now, I was classically trained and uh, enjoyed nothing but classical. I thought that R&B music was just the worst, okay? You also have in Detroit a big investment in public education. They had an incredible public music program in these high schools, and Motown artists came from these communities. Back when I was in school, Ford Motor Company would give the class tickets to go to see the uh, Detroit Symphony. I saw them playing violins, French horns, and oboes, and bassoons. I thought that was the greatest sound ever, you know what I mean? So that's what got me going was something about what was in that soil in Detroit, you know, that just sort of folks came up. I've been in some, you know, really cool company in the studio, but having that group of creative people in the same room, it's just incredible. And they were actually playing real instruments back then too. Like, they actually could play the piano and play the drums, and no machines needed. I didn't know much about Hitsville, USA, because I lived on the east side. Anyway, I dared take that coach and go to 2648 West Grand Boulevard. And what a world I walked into. She came to audition a few times. I would find nice ways of saying, eh, Martha, you know, come back later. And I must have looked like I was going to cry or something, because he said, answer this phone. I'll be right back. His right back was four hours. I walked in my office. And before I could speak, she says, you got an important call from such and such a so-and-so, and this one right here, and I think you ought to answer this line right here. So I said, Martha, how would you like to work as my secretary? She says, okay. It was just everybody working in the same spirit, everybody with one accord, making hit records. 
and it was great to be there. We were recording sometimes tracks without the singer, and according to the union, you had to have a singer singing it live. You couldn't do tracks in those days. And I was doing um, pretty good in the office, but when the union man made a surprise visit, Everybody went crazy. They said, well, you're doing a session in there, and the union guy is coming, you know, <laughs> the union guy is coming. We told Mickey, man, got to put somebody on the mic. His secretary overheard it. I'll do it. <laughs> and that, that was the chance she was waiting for all this time. <laughs> and she grabbed the mic and started singing it, and she was Martha. What happened was, you know how a preacher, he'll stand in front of the pulpit with his arms open wide, saying, the doors of the church is now open. And everybody came in, all kind of people, doing all kind of things, and getting fulfilled with spirit. These were exciting times because it's the first time you're hearing, you know, rock and roll in our city and people that we knew. I witnessed Stevie Wonder coming to Hitsville. I was, what, 11 years old when I went to Motown. That particular day, Smokey was at Motown, and he said, you know, I heard you can sing. I said, yeah, I can sing better than you. I was like, <laughs> you know, a little smart mouth kid. Everything Stevie played, a little, a little genius. We didn't know what a genius was, right? For me, it was like going into a candy shop, a place where all these instruments were around. So he st sat down at that big, long grand piano, and he played it as if he had known Liberace himself. I said, my, his baby's talented. He went to the full set of drums. He was so good. When he jumped on the organ, played the organ, set him on a stool and gave him the bongos. Next, he stood up and he took a little harmonica out of his pocket. He could play everything. And we were like, OK, that's what a genius is. <laughs> Barry Gordy said, this kid is a wonder. I probably was paying very little attention to people and I said, oh, you know, I'm glad to meet you, okay. And, uh, I think until I got to Diane Ross and I heard that voice, it was like, okay, I'm in love. You know, goodbye instruments. <laughs> Song at the Apollo. Yeah, called Fingertips, which went to number one, I believe. Yes, it is. Because he wanted to get more excitement. So he came out for his bow. Instead of taking a bow, he told all of you, clap your hands just a little bit louder. Clap your hands just a little bit louder. Yeah, 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 yeah. Clap your hands just a little bit louder. Clap your, clap your hands just a little bit You know, and everybody started getting up, going, and everything, and, and it got good to him, and the people was clapping their hands and and he wrote a song. particular night was an amazing night. The girls were screaming and all this kind of stuff. That was probably the really first time that I understood the power of, you know, when you do a performance a certain way, you get the kind of reaction that you get. We blew the house out. Yeah. Motown in the earlier days was like going to Disneyland. You know, <laughs> and, but it was a musical Disneyland. I mean, you could walk through the halls of Motown and see Marvin Gaye playing the piano over in the corner. Um, you would see the Holland Brothers running down with their music saying, man, I think it should be like this. It was upstairs in the hallway in the house. 
And I was just banging. Lum -de -lum -de -lum. I said, man, that's really fucking, man. What's the name of that? You know what he said? I don't know yet. I said, man, what you gonna do with that? Is somebody gonna sing it or what? I said, you want it? I said, yeah. By the following Monday, we had everybody come in and putting background. Smokey coming into the reception area. I think the Supremes were sitting there too. And he said, I want everybody come in the studio. Just like that. And this is a pretty voice. He said, repeat after me. Come on, is everybody ready? Come yeah. on, is everybody ready? Yeah. Mickey's Monkey singing on that. Of course, it's the Miracles. Martha and the Vandellas. Two of the Temptations. Marvelous. Mary Wilson. Probably had more artists on it than any other song that I could remember. He said, OK, start the music. Go on. Long de people making music, getting our feet wet. I think that the way we had Motown was a once in a lifetime musical event. You can never get the amount of talent that was in one room in Motown. Steve Lynn, Marvin Gaye, Diana Ross, the Supremes, uh, uh, all of these people who are, are juggernauts. And you look at a young Michael Jackson, you know, and, 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 and Smokey Robinson talks about seeing Michael Jackson for the first time and just going like, what is that? call from Mr. Gordy one night. Listen, we just uh, signed this group called Jackson 5. You're going to be their manager, so you better come down. He said, this is Shelly Berger. Show them what you can do. They start doing the Smokey Robinson. Who's loving you? There is talent, and there is talent, and there is talent, and then there is genius. And then he said, well, I <laughs> songs we learned back in those days was the Motown songs, so they were the biggest songs on the radio. Next you know, we were in the recording studio after that. There was Marvin Gaye, there's Stevie Wonder, there's Smokey Robinson. And we had to sing their songs in front of them. I was so nervous. You know, whenever I sing Who's Loving You, especially young people, they're going to be, well, why'd you sing Michael Jackson song? Yeah. Oh, Michael Jackson song. I wrote this song before Michael Jackson was born. <laughs> <laughs> he had, that's his song now. Who's Loving You is Michael Jackson's song, and all the people that you hear singing it now sing it like him. As the company grew, so did the challenges of managing a team. I realized that I needed to not only give them direction in music, but whatever I had learned about life, I could use that in some way pushing people, but not making them feel they were being pushed. So I created competition, you know, beat me <laughs> if you can. Have a better record than I have. And for as many of them did. <laughs> the competition grew and developed, one feeding off the other. And it made you sharpen your, sharpen your tools, you know. It made you dig a little deeper to come up with something that would stand apart. Competition breeds champions. 
But remember, you can't let the competition get in the way of the love. If you're producing an artist, say Stevie, you would want him to have a hit. And if I see you working with him, I want him to have a hit as well. Because if they become successful, everybody has an opportunity to work with that artist as well. It's all this with love now. You take love out the picture, it's ego, jealousy, stuff that can kill any organization. I always had Smokey, why don't you write a song for us? But he couldn't. He was writing material for the Miracles and for Mary Wells. The best thing that happened for the Temptations is when Mary Wells left the company. That opened him up for us. The Temptations, we, we were trying to get some hits on them. We couldn't get any hits until finally I got a hit on them with the way you do the things you do. He's using Eddie Kendrick's voice to sing lead vocal. You got a smile so bright. You know you could have been a candle. So I looked at the lyrics and I said, got a smile so bright. Could have been a candle. That's some hokey stuff. Mm. Yeah, smoking, just laughing. So yeah. My greatest competitor for getting music out on The Temptations was Norman Whitfield. They had a contest to see who could break the Beatles' command on top five. Oh, that was that kind of a contest. It, I was hurt many times by not having releases. That made me stronger enough to get the public and Mr. Gordy to get away from that Smokey Robinson sound. Norman Whitfield came to me. He said, if she will write the lyric for me and get this, the release on them. I said, man, leave the Temptations alone. Now, you know, Don Well, <laughs> try and beat Smokey out. He got problems. He said, Ed, Ed, I think this is it. <laughs> Bill came up and he kind of knocked Smokey out of that, that release. So Smokey was not happy about it. I love you, girl, with all my heart and soul. And they were all using Eddie Kendrick to sing the lead because that was the first hit they had had. Heck, I knew Paul Williams and David Ruffin were in that group, man, who were awesome singers. So I wanted to write something for them. Everybody was bragging about Norman knocking him out. So when he said, uh, I got a new record on The Temptations to follow up my guy. Nothing you can say could tear me away from my guy. That was selling the score. He said, I'm coming up with a new record, my girl. And so, of course, we thought that was the most ridiculous thing <laughs> we ever heard. <laughs> I mean, you come up with my guy, you can't come my girl, what are you gonna do? My mother-in-law, you know, my wife. <laughs> I was actually writing my girl because I thought that David Ruffin had such a great voice. Uh, he had this unique voice and I just wanted it to be kind of like isolated. So we were recording it, you know, we were running it down and uh, I had Jameson to play. So we were just still running it down. We hadn't even started to record it yet. And Robert White, you know, he was the lead guitarist for the Funk Brothers. And Robert stood up and started walking around the studio with his guitar and he's playing, boom, 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 just walking around. And he started laughing. Oh, no, 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 man, no, no, no. And I said, no, 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 no. <laughs> Are you kidding? <laughs> That's in the record. That's on the thing. And it became one of the most famous guitar riffs ever. And he was just kidding around. Went crazy and smoking came by, and he came backstage and he said, "Man, I got a song for you guys that I think will be a smash." So us men, young and cocky man, bring it on. We sing anything. I've got sunshine on a cloudy day. When it's cold outside. I've got the month of May I guess you say What can make me feel this way My girl, my girl, my girl. Talking about my girl, my girl When Paul Reiser added the strings 
and the horns, my girl took on a whole nother kind of life. So I took my classical training and put it to use. <laughs> and uh, we came up with, um, with my girl, as you hear it today. and sent a record up there called My Girl. I refused to go in the studio. I was just totally wiped out. February 1965, Mr. Gordy sent a congratulation telegram saying that we had sold over a million records and we were number one. And also the Beatles sent us a telegram congratulating us. I have it hanging up in my heart. Yeah. <laughs> I don't need no asked me a thousand times, hey man, aren't you sorry you didn't keep my girl for yourself? Had it not been for The Temptations and David Ruffin and Norman Whitfield, I probably would have never even written My Girl. Barry wanted us to be competitive. We were fiercely competitive against each other, but we helped each other. The Motown family. Quality control was something that I picked up from Ford Motor Company. After the assembly line was done, it still had to go to quality control to make sure that the quality was there. You bring your record in on said artist and you play it, and then you get a vote. The main thing, it was to get hits. So if somebody's record was better than yours, you're looking at the company as a whole. Those quality control meetings were beautiful and loving, but vicious. Okay, let's, can yeah. we finish our meeting here? It's been, it's afternoon now. So we're getting to the conclusions and assignments. A decision will be made on the Temptations record. Which side is it? My girl. My girl? I mean, think that's not a hit. I mean, think it is a hit. I mean, it's undecided. Okay, what are your comments? Strike me as being a smash of any kind, but it's a, it's a Temptations record. I like it. Definitely, I like it. It's a nice, clear sound, yeah, and it's a, it's a hit. It's kind of hard for a regular like that not to be a hit. What about Ralph? I passed. <laughs> no, you can't pass, it's you not know. Clear. I don't know, it doesn't do anything to me. I think it's a hit. The song's a hit. OK, we're releasing this one. I mean, since you think it's a hit record? Right uh, I think it's, I think it is the best record they have, and I feel that it could be a very big hit. So that's it. You'll find out whether or not we got it. To be in there with a bunch of guys that you're competing with, and yet they're constructively giving you some information that they think will make your product better. You could tell that the writers had been sit down and talked to and trained. The beat was solid. Old Jameson had that bass out there. You understand me? It was way out there. They didn't just throw a record out. You could tell that record was docked on. It was, it, it was nourished. It was beat. It was, you're talking about something whooped. You know, it was whooped. Tracks of My Tears was one of those songs. I, when the first time I took it in there, you know, they listened to it and they said, oh, yeah, man, that's a good song. It's, 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 it's really good, man. But you ended it up wrong. So take a good look at my face. You'll see my smile. Up with the chorus. It wasn't ending up with take a good look at my face. It wasn't ending with that. I was ending it up with that little groove thing. I need you, need you. And they all looked at me and said, You crazy? As strong as the chorus is, you gonna end that with that? I need you. You gotta go back and change that, so I did. <laughs> yeah, just the So they were cut 
cutthroat, but they were constructive. There was nothing like it. Barry had a great ear. He was always saying, if you don't get them in the first four to eight bars, you got to go back to the drawing board. He, he used to say that all the time. We got to get them in the first 10 seconds. We had to try to come up with these fabulous intros, you know, something that would catch your attention immediately. And that's what. Dun 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 I know you want to leave me. Mm -hmm. I know you want to leave me. But I refuse to let you go. We stopped the record probably. I don't know, because sometimes I always stop. OK, OK, you win. It's coming out next week. Because you mean that much to me. Everybody had to speak their truths, what their truths were. You're free in here. Whatever you say, it will never be held against you. I challenge anybody, including me. They saved that for when Smokey had a song up against mine, and we had two songs there. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. I, I speak the truth. Uh, not that that was actually their opinion. They just did it to get at you. Uh, no, no, because they wanted to test me always. So when I had a record called um, Temptations. Dream come true. Dream come true. Mm -hmm. That was it. <laughs> Dream. True, da 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 da, dream come true. I mean, it was phenomenal. It's a great record. And, you know, his song was compared to mine. You know, mediocre. That was, you know, <laughs> and uh, when I said how many people liked my song, and there's no hands went up. <laughs> and Smokey, I saw him looking at people. And, ha, 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 you know, I mean, it was all it was all a coup. It was a coup. <laughs> but because the, the company was such a democratic situation and this quality control, stuff like that happens, you know? So that was it. The first step would be the writing of the song, the creative part. Then we had to deal with the selling part, with the distributors, create, sell, collect. Of course, to get the talent picture and what goes on behind the company, there could be none better than Barry, naturally, who started out. And of course, from the sales picture and what makes a record company tick in sales, the dollars and cents, which is very vital, Mr. Barney Ailis, vice president in charge of sales. He was a strong Italian who I convinced to work for me. But it was not easy getting him to give up his great position where he was at the top of his game. Him and I used to hang out together. And one night I saw at a great new restaurant I've just been going to the last month called the Chop House. We came in and they saw me with him and they said, I'm sorry, we don't uh, serve black people here. I said, Jesus, that's fantastic because I don't eat them. And they, they, they looked at him and said, you know, and he's, you know. Then I got a little Sicilian. And we sat down, and of course, people were staring at us and all that, but, but the point is that Barney didn't care. Barry and I had a great relationship, and Barry was great in the studio, and I was great with the distributors. My whole dream was to make the world understand, hear our music, and they could either like it or not like it. But when we couldn't get music played on the white station, said, what makes you think black, white people are going to like your music? You know, I said, I want all people. It's not black music. It's music by black artists. I can remember when they were promoting my records, and Barney Ellis took me to the station, CKLW, mm -hmm. which was the powerhouse station. Yeah. And the guy looked at me. He said, I'm going to tell you something, Eddie. I'm playing this record because of Barney Ellis. He made that happen. Barry was most interested in where the records were going in the charts and was he getting paid, which I collected. One of the stories when I came to Motown was that the Mafia owned Motown and it kind of lent to the folklore of it. And yeah, Barney looked like that Italian mafiosa guy. Yeah, I mean, he got me in so much trouble. <laughs> He's been run by the mafia. You see that guy in there? He can't even leave Detroit. Remember what he told me? <laughs> you know, I said, Barney, you know, you look like you could be the mafia or something. He said, yeah, well, that's served me well. Many <laughs> times, many times to get your records played, you know. Yes. And I was criticized by a lot of black people for having the white people there. He's a traitor. He won't hire black people. I said, what do you mean? Come in, look and see. I got a lot of black people, but I also got white people. But it's not a matter whether you're black or white or blue. I want to win. In some cases, the best person was white. 
Other cases, the best person was a woman. The fact that there were women in key positions at Motown seemed natural to me. Well, we drove her crazy. We got on her nerves. Yeah, I, didn't, I, I didn't realize she was only 21. But at an early age, she was very, very smart. I didn't realize how forward-thinking it was until I saw many other organizations where there was not a reciprocal kind of picture. All of Barry's sisters worked in the company at one point or another. They did jobs that men would do and did them better. Most companies that we would visit, no woman in no key, key position making no decisions. But he had them at Motown, and he had black, white, and Jews working at Motown. So he wasn't stuck on the thing of, you know, well, this is a black company, it's got to be all black. The color of business is green. You know, I got a lot of credit for all that, and sure, I put it together, but these people grew on their own. And at some point, you know, it was not me, it was magic. And it became a brand. Thanks to the teenager, the record business is a big, big business. They marketed Motown as the sound of young America. Children who had been born after World War II were coming into their teen years by the early 60s, and they were aware of the importance of that market for selling records. You saw the Motown label, you were gonna buy it whether you knew what it was or not. The Motown label and brand became that important. If it's on Motown, that's the shit. You know, they, you know, I'm, I'm buying it. I got to listen to it. Artist development was a key station on the production line. My sisters really persuaded me to bring in the charm school. So I had no idea that it was going to be as important as it was all of us were just, if an idea sounded good, we'd try it, you know. It was a critical part of the equation that you not only create great talent, great songs, but now you've got to present those songs. Ford never saw that kind of thing on the assembly line. They were grooming their artists for the long run. And we had signed with Motown, and uh, so we had to go through what everybody else at Motown went through, which was we had our pictures taken, and then we learned how to move choreography, you learn how to move as a band, go through the whole thing, and we did that. And uh, they, we knew we were a challenge. I don't care who you became, who you were, whatever. Two days a week when you were in Detroit, you had to go to Artist Film, so we go over there. You used to do stuff. And then sometimes you try to dance, and you couldn't dance. <laughs> Wait a minute, what you mean, man? I talk Michael, man. <laughs> <laughs> Charlie Atkins was our choreographer, and he would stop and say, boy, I am so glad you're the lead singer, so I don't really have to try to show you these steps. You just stand over there and sing. <laughs> People like Maxine Powell taught them how to walk and talk and do things gracefully. This department would groom and polish them so that they could appear in number one places around the country, and even before the king and queen. You know, they came from humble beginning, but I told them where they would be appearing, and they laughed and said that I was out of my mind. But with me, it isn't where you come from, it's where you're going. And she said, I don't teach you how to use a spoon or a fork. You gotta learn that at home. You know, I teach you how to be proud and to walk and, and hold yourself from a higher standard from inside. We start with body language. Your body language tells so much about you. You do not protrude the buttocks. She was making us have self-confidence and building our self-esteem, letting us know that we have to be socially accepted in order to do this. To represent not only a kind of music, but a culture and spirit of a people. Now, some black folks would be like, man, why I got to do that? You know what I'm saying? Why I got to act white in front of these white folks? I want to be me. I want to be black. They calling me nigga anyway. Why, not I, why don't I just own that? And, and Barry was like, yeah, you could own that. But then what happens? What happens to the art? Because Barry was like, the art is colorless. The music has no color. It just has a feeling. It has a, has a pulse to it. Some people didn't get it, but they get it now. No one spent longer in artist development than the Supremes. My mother had parents who had worked in the cotton fields in the South, and many of them had not gone to school. Our parents wanted us to get an education, go to college. Uh, by the time we got to Motown, 
I didn't want to go to college. You know, I'm like, I want to make records. I remember with the Supremes, they were singing, and I thought it was making faces. I said, what are you doing? And they said, what are we doing? We're singing. I said, well, it looks like you're making faces to me. Who in the hell would have thought all those different artists, the Supremes and people, had to, oh, my God, you should have seen those girls when they first came there. You would have never believed it. The fabulous Supremes. How about it, Ed? So they were waiting around, and they were being called the no-hit Supremes. Stop hurting me. Oh, now, don't you think you're old? I would tell the producers, whatever it takes to get them a hit, we just have to keep trying. If they don't get a hit, it's our fault, not theirs. I cut about three records on them, and, you know, nothing happened. And then Barry cut about three records on them, nothing happened. You know. But my heart can't take you no more. And then finally, uh, Holland Doge Holland, who had actually written Where I Love Go for the Marvelettes. Oh, yes, wait a minute, Mr. Postman. Wait, wait hey, Mr. Postman. Marvelous didn't like it. They didn't want to sing it. I was talking to Gladys Horton, and when she said, no, baby, we don't do stuff like that. I said, what you say? <laughs> you better wait a minute, wait a minute. That was the first for me. And so I said, man, I gotta, I gotta find somebody to do this song. Let's... Then I saw Mary Wilson one day. I said, Mary, Mary, baby, 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 I got this song. I just finished for you guys. And she said, yeah? Is this the song that you gave to Gladys? I said, what are you talking about? I told Eddie Holland, I said, Eddie, we need a hit. Because if we don't get a hit, our parents are going to make us go to college. And, and that song is not a hit. Got them in the studio, and they did a song, you know. I can't forget that name. It was like a nightmare. Baritone. Oh, man. Diane was upset and everything. She was going to go. Talked to Barry about it. And Barry came down, listened. He said, "Well, wait a minute. This this sounds like it could be something, you know." Baby, 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 don't leave me. Oh, please don't leave me all by myself. You came into my heart. When the record came out, they were actually opening the show, the Dick Clark tour. And by the time the tour was over, they were closing because Where Did I Love Go had taken over. Number one, before you could say Jackie Robinson, you know. You were a perfect guy. Then everybody at Motown was at our feet. Now, we were no longer the no-hit Supremes. And I was standing outside Motown. Barry Gordy said to me, listen, concentrate on the girls. This group will carry the company. I think we were the only girl group to have five consecutive number ones. Of course, Holland Doja Holland did all these songs. Were... Holland Doja Holland were the gods at Motown. They were like right under Barry as far as I was concerned, you know, in terms of their importance. There was that quality and those kinds of songs that resonated with America and they didn't know what they were even feeling. That was them. That was the genius. From New York City, the R.C. Republic presents the Motown Review. We had written a song, we produced it, and we're now selling it. We got this idea of taking the artist on the road with our own band. Smokey always closed the shows because he was the star and the one everybody respected. But everybody was trying to get to that ending spot, and so they do all kind of stuff to move back in the show. Whoever went on first would just do the best that they could be, you know, like make the stage so hot, then it was like, okay, beat that. How do we really get the people screaming? How do we get Marvin Gaye? How do we get him? You know, we love the temps, we love the miracles, but I swear on the Bible, when it comes to singing, we try to out sing them suckers every time. We love the tops, but when they would go out there, they talking about trying to kick our ass. I'm some, but please, better back up before we act up. You know, when we go out there and start going through all that choreography and throwing the microphone up and all that razzmatazz that we done, please, we baptize that ass in fire. It's like chicken come out fighting. <laughs> tops made it hard for us, cause Levi Stubbs. Leave our stuff was no joke.
outdance nobody. But we had a way of doing our own that looked like we was doing a whole lot. We weren't doing shit. <laughs> we took off so big in the Detroit area, Barry decided he had to get us on the road. And that opened up a whole new world for us. Our first Motown review was 94 one nighters. Barry waved to us as we left Detroit in this broken down trailway that didn't have a toilet. That's three months of traveling. Two hotel visits in the whole three months. So most of the time we were sleeping with our head up against the window or against the seat and partner. Traveling was really hard. But I think working together, also being young, made a great deal of difference. Every day it was a new adventure. When we first started going, especially to the deep south, Mississippi, and all around in there, the kids were very separated, man. Living in Detroit, we had ethnic neighborhoods, but we didn't call it segregated because didn't have that same feeling as the South. We weren't allowed to stay in the hotels. We weren't allowed to use the bathroom on the highway and actually see a water fountain that only black people could use. It was like, hmm. There was a fear in me where I wanted to go home. I was ready to go back home. I remember the first time we went to Atlanta. So I got off the bus first and went into the waiting room. As soon as I walked into the waiting room, I felt this thing against my head and looked up. The sheriff had put a gun to my head and said, nigga, get out of here. Now, I didn't know I was in a white waiting room. I didn't know nothing about that then. It scared the hell out of me, man. I, I still feel that. And put that cold steel against my head and it scared the hell out of me. It was rough out there, man. I mean, we've been shot at from wanting to go to the toilet. You know, it's, it's just crazy stuff. We had a, a major problem in Norfolk, Virginia. We did a gig there, and whites was trying to start some crap. The Temps was on stage, Tops and their crew would stand on the side of the stage. And then when Tops would go on, the Temps would position ourselves. Even in our competition and trying to be flashed on and all that, when push comes to shove, we still just working together. So we finished the show, loading up the bus because we had to go to the next city. The next thing I heard, pow, pow, pow. I dived on the floor because I know gunshots when I hear them. They missed the gas tank by inches. Scary stuff. At that point, I was really ready to go home. We had assassinations, murders, race riots, kids being burned, burnt, kids being burned. I mean, how do you, you know, schools burned up. Where's this coming from? Where are these people coming from? The places that we played during the 60s, oh yeah, it was rough. We played Columbia, South Carolina. First time we went there, there was a rope right down the center of the theater. Blacks on one side, whites sitting on the other. And all that's going on, and yet the music of Motown was growing in the hearts of everyone. At one of the concerts, uh, actually, Smokey had said we were on tour, and he, he told the promoter we were not going to perform if they kept that rope down the... Um, down the middle. After a while, man, we started going back to those same places. And all the kids were dancing together and they were mingling and having fun. Blacks and whites, side by side, enjoying the music. I can remember when uh, I was at Motown, Barry was in the studio, and uh, Martin Luther King, King uh, walked in. Man, that was a shock of my life. Mm -hmm. Honest to goodness. <laughs> I mean, you know, he's just like God walking in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the time I met Dr. King when he came, um, when he realized our music was helping him in his movement, this guy who I admired so much and who was doing so much and out there fighting was saying that I was bringing emotional integration to a lot of people. He was seeing them dance to our music and it was like positive. And he said, you know, I would like to be connected with your company, you know, and I'm saying, oh my God. <laughs> a whole lot of stuff that they were trying to do legally or spiritually or how they were trying to do it. We were just doing it with music. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight, live from New York, The Ed Sullivan Show. Growing up, everyone would surround the TV and watch the Ed Sullivan Show. So for us to be on it, the first time was big. It was December 27th, 1964. I was 10 years old, and it was a moment that changed my life. 
Come see about me is sung by these girls here, the Supremes, three youngsters from Detroit. Let's hear it for them. Sullivan Show meant that you had arrived. Because we ended up being on there what, 14 times. That you never ever gonna Supremes on TV that night, it was magical to me because I had never seen black women on television, although we were called colored at the time, or anywhere for that matter, who conveyed such glamour and such grace. And nobody was used to seeing us portrayed the way I saw the Supremes. That's why I missed most of the first song, calling everybody I knew, saying, color people on, color people, color people on TV. Have a fine welcome to the Supremes. on those white shows, they could see this black girl coming into white folks' TV screens when that wasn't happening. Anytime you really saw black people, there was something terrible going on, you know? We were at an era now where TV has opened up the borders of the world, and now they're looking at glamorous, beautiful black faces. You know, we were able to understand a culture that had never been seen before, and Mr. Gordy put that fairy dust on it that made it palatable to white America. He made black chic. The Supreme. Step into 15,000 watts of lights, wearing $6,000 worth of silk and sequins, and their sound sets the room on fire. That's why Diana Ross and the Supremes count on this new deodorant, arid, extra dry. The impact that their image had on the black community was profound, and that was everything from how they dressed, how they performed, to where they were allowed to do these things, those doors that they were able to get into. It forced white people and black people to look at each other, say there's a little bit of you and me and a little bit of me and you. It was so exciting to hear people talk about their hopes, wishes, and dreams, and to actually see it come true. Ain't no mountain high, ain't no valley low, ain't no river wide enough, baby. We had come from poverty, and now we bought our parents' homes. This is like, my daughter is a supreme. So happy, so proud. There were so many artists made famous at Motown. All of the talented people would line up and want to be a part of Hits for USA. The energy at the one building was just so great. They would buy one building, then buy another. They went from marketing, sales, artist development. It was a win-win. And the brand got bigger and bigger, and the business got bigger and bigger, and then it went around the world. I was 16 years old. And there, the Supremes, and Martha and the Vandellas, and Stevie and the Miracles, on stage in front of you, you die and go to heaven. Motown represented the next generation of American music in the way the Beatles did it in Britain, and then fed into the mainstream. Tamla Motown artists are our favorites. The uh, Miracles, Marvin Gaye, uh, Mary Jay Wells, Wells, to name but 80. As the 60s unfolded, that generation realized they potentially had the power to change everything. spoke to one of our accounts in Atlanta, and he says, you know, we don't sell any nigger records down here. And I said, excuse me? Did you sell Diane Ross and Spring? Yeah, they're a big seller for us. You sell Smokey Robinson and Miracles? Yeah, we sell a lot of that. What about Stevie Wonder? Yeah. I says, well, surprise, you sell the nigger records. And Diana, I just thought, set a pathway for women like me to walk through, you know? I, I, I do. Barry Gordy did inspire me, especially when I decided I wanted to start a record company with my friends. We just took that model and did our own thing with it. Now, could it ever be as big? No, but this is who we looked up to. I'm a 25-year-old white gay Londoner, and Motown 
music has affected me so hugely, and I couldn't be any further from Detroit. <laughs> when our production line really started working, it was phenomenal. In 1968, we had five records out of the top 10 on the Billboard charts, with the number one record being I Heard It Through the Grapevine. Uh, Norm Whitfield would record his songs over and over again on different artists, and they would always be hits. The first people to ever record I Heard It Through the Grapevine was The Miracles and Me. However, the sales department felt it was too bluesy for us. They didn't want us to sing that kind of song. So he said, okay, fine. And then he cut it on Gladys Knight and the Pips. <laughs> it was a smash hit. And then after that? No, no, he cut, he cut it on, uh, on Marvin. No, Marvin was last. He recorded mm -hmm. on Marvin after it had been a huge hit on Gladys Knight and the Pips. No, no, no. No, that's not true. Want to bet? Yeah. How much? A hundred? hundred. It's a bet. You guys got this on tape? What happened is Marvin had recorded it had been turned down. Not before Gladys Knight and the okay, Pips. Okay, where's the phone? Who, who's yeah. got it? Yeah, not before Gladys Knight and the Pips. Okay, um, I need to make a <laughs> long-distance call. I recorded this song on Marvin Gaye first. Like, I brought in the meeting and I submitted it. When consequently, it, I lost out. But this particular song, I would not let die. I went to many clubs with Barry, even though I wasn't invited, and I hounded him till he was very, very angry with me. So I said, would you please give me permission to cut the song on another artist? So he says, I don't care what you do with the song. Just don't bug me with it anymore. Charts. And Barry looked at me and says, uh, I don't know what you got, son, but I'm really proud of you, you know. Now, it was time to put out a Marvin Gaye album. So I, in fact, started my campaign once again. They said, well, I guess he's right. We'll just go ahead and put it in the album. And lo and behold, this record was picked out of the album. It went on to be the largest song in the history of Motown. different versions of the same song. It was like clever production work as far as I'm concerned, because good is good, and great is even better. Brenda. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, look, I'm here with Smokey. Tell me the, the Grapevine record and who recorded it first and what happened. I mean, Marvin recorded it after Gladys. That's what I said. No, incorrect. Sorry, sorry Smokey. Yeah, but that's a drag like a dog. <laughs> That's really a drag. I mean, I hate that. I know. Here. Okay, Brenda, thank you. No, I don't thank you nothing. You get off the phone. <laughs> <laughs> it's very hard for anybody to go through the cycle of success. People treat you differently. You treat people differently. My problem was, as their manager, I had to tell them the truth, and that was not always easy. And love means building other people, even when they don't know they need to be built. And it's the most thankless task <laughs> that one can endure. We had an interesting relationship, Barry and I, because I think we we're so very much alike. Uh, I was much younger, and I needed to have my independence and to spread my wings. I had figured out that I wanted the Supreme to move from the pop R&B class to standards. 
and I wanted him to be in the class of Lena Horne, Sammy Davis Jr., and all those people. Then, when she went to Manchester, is when she tried the first time, you, you know about it, somebody loves you. You're nobody. And she did it, and I thought it was good, you know. The crowd didn't like it like they did Baby Love. Or, hey, give a nice applause. And so I came back, she said, I'm not doing it anymore. The audience hated it, and so did I. I said, but I loved it, it was the first time. Well, I hated it, and I'm not doing it on the second show. Oh, man, now that was a big deal. I'm not doing it, I'm defying you on the second show. So I'm saying all the stuff that I'd built up with her up to this point, it crumbled because I knew me and I knew that I could never work with her again if she violated our agreement after one show. And then when she said, I'm not gonna let you ruin my career. You are nobody. <laughs> what? <laughs> me? You said, I'm just not doing it. I said, okay, you decide who you want to satisfy, me? Oh, those 700 people out there. Just make up your mind. I was very strong. <laughs> I was proud of myself. You make up your mind. <laughs> she looked at me and said, okay. And uh, I walked out. When I got outside, it hit me. All of a sudden, I don't have this star. That's my biggest star in the world. What am I going to do with the rest of my life? What am I going to do with the rest of my life? And now, ladies and gentlemen, the Supremes. And then she goes out in the unique Diana Ross style. She went through most of the show, and I was there, and all of a sudden I hear something that sounds like the middle of the song, and I think I'm dreaming. I'm looking at him saying, oh, that's what I would like for her to say. I mean, it was just this kind of surreal feeling. And then she was singing it in full oh, blast. You know, my life was back. <laughs> no, my life had left. She came out of the thing. The other girls went by and I congratulated them, but Diana just kept walking. I said, but Diana, I'm really so happy. Because I know she had to do some thinking too. And she just stopped for a moment and said, I did it for you. And she walked on. And, uh, <laughs> you know. Still the same. You'll never change. Never change. Yeah. I was stuck there. She did it for me. You know, she did it for me. It was in that moment that I realized our relationship had changed to something different. When people say Motown was a family, they have no idea that Motown was really a family. <laughs> you know, we had close relationships. You know, Diane and I had a love affair. Marvin married my sister. The love and family atmosphere at Motown defined the company, but it made things at times very complicated. When you first start, it's a passion thing, right? And then once you start having some success or you get famous, then all this other stuff comes with it. Sharks is coming all the time. You know, they're coming from everywhere, man. There's a lot of smoke being blown. It's wild, because this is a very wild business, you know? It's like the wild, wild west. 
The Holland Dozier leaving Motown was not a major surprise to me. I saw it coming because they were so great. They had so many hits. The, the friction with the Holland Dozier and Holland was personal. Barry always found himself trying to give me that which I wanted. I wanted more of this. I wanted a higher royalty. Okay, give him that. So when I came to him with, I don't know what it was, or some label or something, whatever, he felt this way. If I give you that label, you stop working for Motown and start working on that label, because that's the way that you are. I said, no, we won't. He said, yes, you will. I know you. You know, and sometimes it's just about principle. He said, it's just wrong and I can't deal with it. You know, I may lose money, I may lose this and that, but I, I can't deal with the principle. Barry told me, you go look, check it out and see you're more valuable to me than you would be to another company. What the other company did end up offering me, I knew he could meet. It's easy to make anybody feel that they deserve more than they're getting. Well, we made $4 million last year, that was great. You should have made 10. And then when lawyers get involved, you might as well forget it. We lost three of our best writers at the peak of their success. And many people thought we would not make it without Holland Dozier Holland. We worried because we had only really worked with Holland Dozier Holland at that point. So it was a big loss for us. That was like breaking up with your old lady. I mean, that's the way we felt. What happens is when you depend so much upon a particular writer or writers of a company, you begin to get a particular thing uh, just from these writers. And when the writers split and feel that they can do better somewhere else, I think that then you have to realize the talents of the artists. On Stevie's 21st birthday, I had this big party for him. Everything was so great. And the next day, I got this letter from his attorney saying, that he had turned 21 and he wanted to reorganize the, his whole deal with me. All is fair in love. He was saying, like, why, why did you do this? And I said, you know, I, I want to do the way I wanted to, I want to do it. And I felt musically, I didn't want to stay in a particular kind of box. And I said, oh my goodness, you know, other artists had left. I was petrified there comes a time in life where you got to do what you got to do we had gone to a few different companies but I think because of the love that in the in the respect that we had for each other, meaning Barry myself, that it felt it felt home. But when I talked to Stevie, he wanted changes and he wanted full control of everything. I felt that he had grown and he was one of the greatest artists around. And so I was forced to relent to his demands. There's a lot of decisions that I've made. I can't say that was the, the best, but it was certainly up there. <laughs> came out under these new arrangements with some of the most brilliant music of his whole career. And I was extremely proud of Stevie, his loyalty, and his ability to take Motown to even greater heights. Stevie is the greatest solo artist of all time um, in any genre. I think Stevie is the one. He's the greatest. If you listen to his music, it's jazz, it's gospel, it's pop, it's everything. Stevie Wonder is one of the most talented people ever. And I mean for all of life. Very one of the best for the artist. You know, the challenge is, uh, obviously, is him proving himself right or us proving him wrong. But at the end of the day, we all win. I owe 
always had the feeling if you don't keep up with the times, if you don't innovate, you, you stagnate. There was always in him the appreciation of the next step. Wait, wait, boys, I want to sign you up. signing with Motown and all the kids around our neighborhood in Gary, Indiana. They didn't believe us because it took a while for us to make our first record. When it came out, it was like a machine. Boom. Oh, darling, all I need is one more chance. Show you that I love you. Won't you please let me get back in your heart? Oh, darling, I was glad to let you go. Let you go, baby. But now since I need you. It was the first time that black kids had a young group that was fabulous, you know. They had, you know, screaming little girls, you know, pigtails and afros. Just when we thought we understood something with the Supremes and the Temptations, and Mr. Gordy took us to another level with the Jackson 5. You think of a black group had a, their own cartoon series? That's mind-boggling. I think he saw the power of television early. Barry Gordy realized if he wanted his artists to become global superstars, and television was the way to do that. We want to move television, Broadway. I want everything for the artists that they could do. Now that they're big as they can be in Detroit, I want to take them to, to Hollywood. He always was pushing that envelope. I mean, soon after that, it was Lady Sings the Blues with Diana Ross. I moved out of Detroit because I wanted to be in the movie business. And I wanted to make strides in areas that Detroit couldn't offer. My creative talents could, could be wide open. There was nothing that I couldn't do. So we became a totally different company. We went from a record company to an entertainment conglomerate. I was the biggest protester about moving to LA, man. I told Barry, no, we cannot move to LA, man. Detroit is our home. There was no in-house studio anymore. That was the big factor. Heck, man, I started sending Barry books on earthquakes and smog, and I, I did. I really did. You know what? That's what we did. We moved out there because he's innovative, and he saw what I didn't see. It was a dream. A dream has no limits, you know? And we used to always say, the sky is not the limit. The sky is the first stop, you know? The world was changing. Music business was changing, the artists were changing, they all had their own ideas. And then you have to make a decision as to how you want to deal with it. We came from this time of, wow, black is beautiful. We can go out and be on stage and look fabulous. And then you got into that social climate change. You know what we came up with? Cloud Nine. Cloud Nine. Mm -hmm. And I said, wait a minute, I'm getting high? I mean, I'm doing fine. <laughs> up here on Cloud Nine. Up here on Cloud Nine. You, you know, thought it, it was promoting drugs. Yeah, it, it, yeah. <laughs> I said, no, we can't be a company that promotes drugs. We can't have that. And so I said, you know, how many say it's not a hit? You know, and I was the only one to raise my hand. <laughs> it was the first Grammy. Got a gold record for it. And then we go on Psychedelic Soul. It's like cultural shock. Wait, what the hell are the Timps doing now, you know? And that also told me something. Well, society is going in a very strange direction. I don't want to glamorize getting high, but obviously the public wanted it and they made me seem wrong. But I didn't like compromising uh, my values on that, that particular record. Things were moving fast and changing. And so maybe he had a kind of vision that was a safe one, but the talent of these different artists in the songs they wrote, they were looking at what was going on and they felt it's time to move forward and encourage the world to be better. Do you feel that entertainers such as yourself should become more involved in uh, the black man's problems today? 
Well, we are involved because we're black men. So we're involved automatically, whether or not we want to be, we're involved. And uh, I think that it's a good thing if you mm -hmm. get in that position to speak out this and, is to what say, I was say, and to this. say what you think of it. The black power organizations were proud of me, but yet against me because I was this company that only did love songs and uh, songs of faith and hope and beauty. So we didn't cross the line, in my opinion. The songs just changed because the world was changing. We changed. We had a different understanding of what was really going on. We wanted somebody to tell us about that. Coming from Sound of Young America to Psychedelic Soul, it was indicative of the times that we were living. We were just singing about what was happening in the world. Rap on. The only person talking about love and brother is the preacher. It was a horrific time. Detroit was on fire. Nobody's interested in learning but the teacher. I remember a line of tanks coming down West Grand Boulevard. It was like I was in a different country. time for people who's doing music when there's blood on the streets, when there's civil unrest. When you believe something very strongly and you feel in your soul that it's time for that to be said, how can you not want to break through and make that happen? And so you realize the power of your voice and what it means to, to the world, not just to blacks, but to whites and to anybody that's listening to you. I think it was uh, around 1969 and 1970 when I stopped thinking so much about my erotic fantasies and I started to think about the war in Vietnam with my brother. I became quite affected by it and um, at the same time there was a great deal of unrest in America. Marvin was a good-looking guy. He was a ladies' man. Being a protest singer, was not Barry's idea of a good thing for Marvin. And we created stuff in Motown where we would say, you have freedom within restriction, you know? I mean, I'm not gonna tell you anything that you're gonna do between here and here, but when you get past there, I gotta stop you. I had to fight for my, um, my creative freedom, you know, my artistic freedom, my, my right to, to produce, my right to to write. Marvin was working on something. I didn't know what he was working on. I talked with him in understanding that there were boundaries, but he said, no, I'm gonna do this the way that I see it. Him doing all of those, those vocals and the layering and the sound of it, he had found the place in himself. Was writing was, was so 
artistic. His production was brilliant. And he would sing with himself. And we would call it Marvin on top of Marvin on top of Marvin. But I was against him writing about trigger-happy policing and stuff about the world, the Vietnam and this and that and so forth. I said, well, we can't do that. I couldn't believe that I sat on a shelf because Motown was kind of afraid of it. They didn't think people could deal with all those issues, you know. They wanted to keep it light and fluffy, but he had hit the vein. He had hit the real thing. I was just concerned about getting off track with the Motown brand. And I was not always right. And this was one case where Marvin came back and threw it in my face, you know, that, hey, you taught us this. You told us, you know, Look at what's happening, write what you feel. And I got a brother in Vietnam, man, you don't understand. And the pollution out there, you know, and that's the truth. And you always said to do that. So what are you talking about? So I said, well, uh, you know, uh, yeah, well, I can't really disagree with you on that. possibly tell you what my favorite song is. My favorite album is What's Going On. It is my favorite album of all time. I, I haven't heard anything before that or since then that takes the place of that being my favorite album. Marvin was correct. God did write it. It's prophecy. It's more poignant today than it was when it came out. Well, you can play that here on the streets when we're having all of the shootings. You can play that song right now. It's needed. You know, maybe that'll make us like, you know, take a couple of steps back and treat people a little better. Mr. Gordy had a very specific vision. We weren't going to talk politics because we're going to keep it commercial. And then it becomes out of your control. These artists that he created were developing and growing his company into places that he didn't even think that, that he could take it. You can have the greatest assembly line in the world, but people are not cars. And eventually they are going to express themselves outside of the system. They saw, say, my career or Marvin's career in a certain kind of way, and we said, no, we don't, we don't see that. We want to do it differently. And as far as me and my life, it was just evolving from one step to the next and learning and not being stuck on any idea that didn't make sense. I now have felt that the idea of reflecting the world was not a bad idea at all. When we were in prison, we appreciated and avidly listened to the sound of Detroit, Motortown. Today, in a time where things are sort of turbulent in the world, the challenge is to again be the loudest bell that you hear ringing that will encourage people to do and be better can't seem to agree on what we all want to hear anymore. And we don't realize that we need music that speaks to our hearts. So we can say, ah, oh, yeah, that's the way I feel. Now, over the years, this room has hosted some of the most talented musicians in the world, from classical to country. But Motown is different. Born in a time of so much struggle, so much strife, it taught us that what unites us will always be stronger than what divides us. So today, more than 50 years later, that's the Motown legacy. You could start something with nothing. It ends up being internationally something. Yes, yeah, it's, 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 Motown is a great example of the American dream. I think the Motown legacy is just the culture. It's part of the culture of the United States. It's not just black culture, it's the country, it's everybody. It was all a divine movement for a purpose. 
to let other talented people know you don't have to suffer under the system, create for yourself. And so Motown became a model. People come from all over this planet to visit this little house, Hitsville, USA, in Detroit, because this music made its way across the globe and this music represented the fabric of their lives in the same way it did for those of us in Detroit. I celebrate a time and space as a little kid who didn't really understand it, but the older I got, the more I can appreciate how it is a stamp on society that will never, ever be forgotten. I can't sum up Motown, but I sure am glad to have been a part of it, to produce music that and endure past my lifetime. It's special. I would never change that in a million years. I would have done one thing. I would have done it a little slower, so I would have enjoyed it more. More and more I think about it, I don't know how the hell it happened in the first place. It was magnetic. All that stuff there in one city called Detroit. Mm -hmm. Every city, every town, every, every place, probably on earth, ratio-wise, with the talent that we had, has that same amount of talent. They just don't have a Barry Gordy. They don't have somebody who could pull that off. Yeah, I think and, the secret, that, you, know, you know, you the secret, brother. Oh, you thank you, that's great. That's <laughs> wonderful, man. But I'm just saying, my thing was to bring the best out of other people, because I couldn't do what you did. I couldn't write as well as you or sing as well as you, but if I make him the best they could be, then I could reach my potential in some way, but all I want to do in those days is make some money, make some music, and get some girls. <laughs> you know? And you did all that. <laughs> the key points that kind of pulled us together, which was very unusual, is we had a company song. Don't ask me to sing it. Uh, <laughs> I wasn't too good with the guys. Because we used to watch their models and see if they could remember it. Yeah. And they would say, no, that no. no, we are, no, I'm not gonna sing it. We are a very swinging company. We are a very famous company. We're a very happy family. Oh, we are. We are a happy singing company, that's all I know. Swinging company. Working hard from day to day. No, I won't do this. I will not do it. <laughs> now you got me all mixed up. I've known that song really well. No one has more energy. No one can you find more unity than it hits feel. USA. <laughs> I can see it. I can see the um, the lyrics. Our employees must be neat and clean and really have something on the ball. Dot, dot, dot. Honesty is our only policy. We're one for one and one for all. Oh. We have a very swinging company, working hard from day to day. Nowhere will you find more unity than at Hitsville Bank. I said Hitsville Bank. I said Hitsville USA. And then we say one more time. Yeah, one more I said Hitsville Bank. I said Hitsville Bank. And it Hitsville USA. USA.